anyhow, today, uh, I wanted to go over, I was helping, I'm working on a little piece about uh, bottlenecks. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun topic, but I thought I would just, uh, as I'm working on that one, I'm realizing that I can't consistently spell there, as in their organization. Always a problem, but you know, that's what the red squiggly is for. My dog always has something to contribute, uh, especially on Mondays. But uh, I thought I would go over some of the, uh, I'll use it as a chance to kind of review my draft. As I said last week, I don't like pairing with people, so I'm pairing with myself here to kind of go over it. So let's, let's, uh, I'll, I'll show you kind of the structure when, when I'm working on stuff, kind of what I do. And that is, I just start writing. That's not exactly true. I often kind of think about an outline. And this started, as you can see, if I go to the bottom of more of kind of a, a little bit of an outline. But, you know, usually I find, uh, you know, uh, as I was mentioning, someone, I spend a lot of time biking to and from dropping my kids off from school in the morning, thinking about uh, what I'm going to be working on, kind of writing in my head. And uh, it's always frustrating, and I get fearful that I'll forget things. But I, I forget who said this, but, you know, it is important to keep track of your ideas. Every every person who spends time on writing or their content creation will tell you to always have a notepad with you, digital or analog. But there's also sometimes when you're thinking through ideas, you want to use this tool that like if you forget it, maybe it wasn't good in the first place. It's a good sorting mechanism. Anyhow, uh, so let's start off with uh, what's going on here. So as always, with all this kind of material, right, everything sort of starts with like the beginning thing. Let's see if I can uh, zoom in. Zoom in. So everything always starts with the idea that you want to get good at software because it's going to be one of the primary tools for running your, your business, right? One of the ways you evolve your business. Now, it's important to evolve and innovate in your business because nowadays, as yeah, maybe not always, but like people are always switching costs between companies is easier, right? So you can always go to some other way of doing something usually. And also just because of the, uh, the, the fungibility of, of software, it makes it easier for competitors to come up with new features, new ways of doing business. So competition is a lot more difficult in an oddly circular way uh, because of software and technology and things like that. Now, that was a really poor way of laying out that thing. But, you know, you can insert that part there. And I think, you know, a good example is uh, how much people rely on uh, in-home grocery delivery. Now, omni-channel retail, right, delivering through multiple channels has been something going on for a while. But I think a lot of it has really been driven by just two things, you know, fearing tech companies who are delivering things. And I think what a lot of those tech companies encounter is, uh, you know, one way to defeat a tech company, uh, a new, you know, as an incumbent is to use what I think of as a siege mentality, right? Like, while wow, these tech companies might have a lot of investment uh, and be able to throw a lot of money at something, right? Which is, you know, the more money you have, the easier it is to uh, operate. Uh, but they don't have the established, uh, in the case of retail supply chains and brand and uh, operational knowledge that uh, an existing companies do. So you can sort of just wait it out. You can sort of just as an incumbent incrementally kind of match the features that they have and not really feel pressured to uh, compete with them. Now, that could be a bad strategy that also sometimes doesn't work out well. But I think that the, uh, you know, the fact that there's lots of um, hotels still in operation, maybe until recently, lots of retail still in operation, so forth and so on shows that and lots of banks especially shows that you can uh, survive against tech companies by just sort of uh, waiting them out by sieging them out. Um, and you know, I guess most spectacularly, you see companies like, uh, like WeWork, who uh, just, you know, blew a whole bunch of money on, uh, on stuff against incumbents trying to build a company, and you had to just kind of wait for them to uh, not really be too successful. Anyways, so a lot of organizations uh, have been working on omni-channel things for a while, multiple ways to uh, go to market to sell their goods. And I think especially with everyone staying, many people staying home nowadays, you get groceries delivered, right? So that itself, right, like is a, a way of using software to uh, run your business dramatically differently. Now, I suppose you could have phone banks and you could call in to do your order. Like people could... Um, 
if you wanted to be completely analog, although a telephone is not really analog, but whatever, you could uh, go door to door and put like groceries that you had or just rely on people to kind of know what you have and then they could call up the number and uh, schedule doing things, but that's not really tenable. So instead, uh, these organizations have to develop, you know, the software they have to not only allow us to s say what uh, groceries we want, but also for scheduling all the logistics behind it and so forth and so on. I don't know. You know, when you write a piece like this, I don't know if it's important to do this kind of uh, throat clearing, this table setting, but sometimes it is. We'll see. I often let other people decide if they want to keep those parts in and edit them out or not. So that put into place, right? Let's let's get to the meat of it uh, so I don't go on too long. But I think as in manufacturing, as in pretty much every type of business or process where you're trying to do stuff, it always seems like domestically at home we apply this type of thinking the least, uh, which is odd because in theory our home life is the most valuable and the one that we would like to optimize, right? Like, you know, slacking off at work is fine as long as no one notices and uh, you can prioritize on other stuff. You only want to optimize your work too much, uh, you know, so much as much as you really uh, sort of are, are bound to so that you can spend time on other things. But this idea of looking at the supply chain, the value stream, like the end in process of how you get from an idea to people using your software and then bringing the cycle back, right? So as I'm always talking about, it's one thing to deliver a project of software, right? Like uh, we need the app that allows, we need to add functionality to our app that allows people to uh, order groceries, but we also need to add functionality to the app that our delivery drivers use to accept payments. And, you know, like the the, the uh, grocery store that we order from Albert Hine, they recently added this uh, thing where you can pay through the app with a QR code that goes to your bank. It's all makes sense in European banking, but it's just a lot. I don't know. They tend to think it's easier to do, but it's actually like, it's easier. It's easier for me to just pay with Apple pay on my phone, but I think it's more, it takes more time for the delivery driver to take out the payment thing and kind of process the payment and wait for it to go through. So they're probably optimizing on the delivery person's time uh, instead of my sort of joy of doing it. I think it's actually shorter to pay in the app, but it's just more annoying because for me, I just hold out my phone and like stick it up to my face and double click the sidebar and pay and I'm done. Uh, so I don't have to do that much and I don't mind waiting a few more minutes. Um, anyways, but that actually is a good example of paying attention to the entire supply chain, right? The entire value stream of all activity that begins of thinking of an idea, planning and budgeting it out, writing the software for it, testing out that software, packaging it up to deploy the runtime stuff, and finally getting the delivery driver and me to work with each other through this piece of software. So in manufacturing and uh, kind of more advanced services think you're always paying attention to what that chain of doing everything is right which is a very all in not just uh, you know all in from the the top view of the company it's not just looking at how each individual thing works right like how your fleet management for your trucks work or how like inventory in the warehouse looks it's important to look at every single thing and that is because if you just locally optimize, right, and this is where the old, you know, gold rat, which kind of gets rolled into uh, uh, lean thinking and then it eventually into DevOps is basically into our software world. Like what you're doing is so you're looking at each of the nodes in that entire network and kind of basically timing how long it takes for, I don't know the words for this, but for your activity to progress uh, through it, right? How, what does it take to get through each of these gates, right? And you can imagine, you know, just to, Let's see if I can type it out. You can imagine, right? Like we have, we have idea for new feature in your software, right? Now, even that is a little fraught because of course it's a new feature, but it's an idea for, let's say new way of running business, right? So there's an idea for a new way of running your organization. And then this goes to like, you know, budgeting, planning, corporate approval, right? Lots of PowerPoints and slides and everything. And then here, eventually we have to like specify software. Then we've got to like code software. And uh, then we'll just say, you know, including QA. And then we got to like 
package verify audit security software right let me let me finish that out there look at how bear puts those nice little arrows in fancy uh, and then we've got to uh, deploy and run software right now again oh and then and then of course there's uh, uh, training people to use software raise awareness for users customers to use now this last part let me let me uh, see if I can bring this up this last part actually this is a really good insight from an otherwise kind of mm, short and complicated paper that that I want to I want to show really briefly so I started thinking of this bottleneck stuff because I was finally reading this paper let me find it if we go to my bookmarks I'll try to put a link to this in the show notes but it says where should your IT constraints be so it's thinking about theory of constraints and bottlenecks in the terms of uh, banking basically there's a lot of fun stuff in here you know it kind of like some basic ideas of what theory of constraints is which is doing a value stream and finding bottlenecks I'm sure that's like not the best definition of holding to gold rat heads and stuff out there but whatever but there's a great uh, this this is something I've never really thought about let me see if it's the right uh, it, it's it basically is like kind of kind of here is like this idea of like awareness of the new feature so even once you get the software out the door you have to worry about and you can kind of see it in this chart here by by <laughs> i think do they call them old people by old uh boomers and uh i guess whatever i am and then uh you know those crazy millennials and their video games uh but you know this is this is a great bottleneck i've never thought of which is basically people's your customers your users awareness that this feature even exists marketing uh you might call it and that can be a bottleneck for adoption right like if people aren't aware that there's some new way of doing things then uh you've got a bottleneck on usage and it kind of ruins all of the work uh that you had going ahead of that but it's a it's an interesting like uh aspect to look at hence the awareness right so you've got let's let's say you've got this entire uh thing going here this kind of process right and then you know according to the idea of how you're improving your software then you've got a whole other set of things that you may not be considering which is like observing and uh analyzing uh how people use your software and then this kind of goes back to the beginning which is like start creating new ideas for how software business works right so there's a lot of stuff that's skipped here right but you got a big old value chain going here or a flow or a process or whatever like the um over there there's this company task top that's headed up by uh mick kirsten which they make a fascinating product and he's uh him and his team are, are smart people and they've done a great job so they basically they've done a great job kind of encapsulating this in this idea of flow he's got a he's got a a pretty good book and kind of trail of knowledge going along this value stream or this flow of work or whatever and it's really, I mean, one, it's a good idea on its own. And it's, it's, it's a very good example of doing marketing and thought leadership that fits with your product. Because what their product does is it's, it's basically project management and governance sort of uh, integration. So all the, these separate parts here, they tend to use different stacks of software or things that are incompatible or whatever. And it's hard to kind of focus on optimizing this entire flow if you're spending all your time cutting and pasting and integrating this this work together. So a lot of what uh, TaskTop, the software stack does, is it, it ingests all the data from the different tools um, kind of makes a normalizes the wrong word, but whatever it standardizes it and then it retranslates it back into the rest of the system. So if it kind of syncs up all of the data, like which is means that each people spend lot, a lot less time doing that. You've got better fidelity of that information as it moves through the chain. And there's also a lot better um, sort of reliable management because you have that information more quickly. But it's definitely um, worth looking into that stuff if you want to kind of integrate all of this stuff together. But 
so you've got this big flow, right? Now the problem becomes these pesky little arrows. Or not, I guess not so much the arrows, but one of the key activities you want to do is go through and see how long uh, your flow, your stuff is sitting in each of these areas, right? And what that means is paying attention to bottlenecks, right? Which is where Goldrat comes in. Now there's this reading Goldrat is fun. And especially if you get the, I think there's a six hour lecture he has somewhere. That's also entertaining to listen to because he's, he's quite a character. Uh, but one of the key insights uh, that people that that is in the gold rat work and that people uh, have adopted is that the I don't know, most important you shouldn't ever be hyperbolic but a very important let's say most important thing to pay attention to are those bottlenecks the slow part in the flow because they are going to be the things your constraint they're going to be your constraint right the thing that's limiting you because they set the pace of how your business can operate they set the pace of how you can evolve the longest phase is basically going to be the thing that sets how long something takes, right? If one, one of these steps takes three months, then, you know, by reducing that down, you're going to speed up the flow. You'll find the next thing that takes the longest amount. It might take two months and then you can reduce that down and you find the next one. And that's how you're really going to speed up flowing through the system. And the reason it's important to flow through the system is one, so you can just deliver that initial, uh, project right so you just have the initial thing but again if you think back to that small batch process of continually defining and learning how to improve your software how to improve your business you need that feedback you need that i'm doing this circle thing you need that constant flow so you need to speed up uh the circle of doing things so you need to focus on removing those bottlenecks so then let's get into the uh, uh the little bit of, of of meat that i was writing here the, the meat that i was writing that's great and that is, let's, I, let, let me look at some common uh, types of, of bottlenecks and, and things to do. Uh, so first of all, you've got the initial uh, part of planning, budgeting, strategy, all of these sorts of things. You know, the problem with dogs is you can't really communicate with them, right? Like it's hard to, to emphasize that uh, if, you, if you want my attention, you shouldn't do things that I dislike. They, they don't seem to really uh, respond to that. Then again, most humans don't as well. So maybe that's just a, a, a problem with me that I expect people to respond to that. But you're at the beginning of your cycle. And I think as with a lot of these things, doing large batches and overthinking things rather than, than acting, smart acting, I guess, uh, is a cause of bottleneck. So what often happens is one, in a large organization, you basically are constantly playing a zero sum game, right? You have a finite amount of resources, a finite amount of attention, and a uh, finite amount of time. Now, I'm no game theorist, so perhaps this is all wrong if I applied some like Welsh complexity thinking or something. But whatever, I'll allow someone who understands uh, stuff better than I do to, to uh, go over that. But essentially, uh, you have a lot of people spending their time trying to define what they think the right business to pursue is, the right feature, the right functionality, and they're competing to be the winner there, right? Again, they're locally optimizing on themselves. And most organizations are built this way. They get compensated and rewarded. They get happiness uh, through winning instead of making sure everyone wins. So, of course, they work that way, right? And so this causes all sorts of slowdowns at first, right? Because you as I think I was talking about at some one of the my little episodes last week, um, you end up spending a lot of time on the meetings for the meeting, and and you spend a lot of your time thinking about how to defeat and defend yourself rather than coming up with a good idea and really working with each other for a better idea for the whole. You know, just common how people could be better type of thinking. And as with all common sense, uh, it's uncommon how often people actually follow it. Anyhow. Uh, so that's a huge bottleneck is just sort of like thinking too much and competing with each other. Now, another thing comes in with, because you're doing such a big batch that you're going to deliver, you know, you're doing a big project, right? It's going to be delivered over 12 months. It's going to require a lot of budget. It's going to carry a lot of risk because you're spending so much money over such a large amount of time. So you want to put more and more analysis, more and more effort into the decision, right? And as you spend more and more time on that decision, right, uh, you end up spending more time on that decision, right? So if you've got such a large investment to be made in time and money, you're going to need a huge ROI, right? A huge return on the investment versus other opportunities that you have. I forget the financial, the accounting term for this, but you've got 
other ways you could spend your money. And when you go to the big meeting to propose that your way should be adopted, you know, if you've got 10 ideas competing for five plus of resources, you want to be somewhere in that top five, if not the top one. And so you're going to have to promise a bigger payoff than other people, right? You're going to have to promise a bigger win. And so it becomes another big burden for you to carry. And so you spend more time on it and you've got to load more and more into it. So you, you kind of not only have this analysis paralysis of like not being able to decide what to do and this competition that's driving a lot of infighting, but then you have to promise such a big win that you, again, spend more time on it. And, and all of this comes together to be a vicious cycle that you end up spending a lot of time uh, and a lot of deliberation on strategy and planning and uh, finance, right? There's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into there. So this bottleneck, as with so many things, right? Like uh, a lot of how I see organizations getting through it is instead of doing such big, gigantic things, they focus on smaller and smaller things. Now, it's really difficult to get to this point, but it, it really does behoove you, especially if you understand the nimbleness that, and smallness that you can achieve with software, right? Like with software, it's possible to do things on a weekly basis. It's possible to change how your business functions on a quarterly basis if you break this bottleneck of annual or, or big term planning. So you start to think breaking that bottleneck means basically uh, s putting a smaller amount of stuff <laughs> through it, which eventually, once you achieve flow, you'll get more stuff going through than if you blocked because you're trying to put these giant things through, right? Like you lower your batch size, uh, to use lean terms. And also, you know, the, the thing that leadership needs to do, probably all the way up to the board, right? Because our shareholders aren't going to do anything. We just want short-term wins. We don't really care how it's possible. Like you can grow, uh, you know, the problem with shareholders, uh, speaking of, I guess, one myself or whatever, is like, as long as, you know, once we get a return on investment, we're totally fine with cashing out and going to another growth thing and letting that, that previous one just like die out. Like who cares? Yesterday's high growth uh, asset, once it starts to decline, shareholders don't care, right? Like we'll just jump to something else and totally desert it. Now that's a simplification, but it kind of shows that you can't really align uh, the motivation of uh, investors uh, too well, you know, further down into the long-term concerns of the organization. So, you know, the board and the senior executives need to be there to kind of set this expectation of we're operating as a company as a whole, not just a bunch of individual sort of pirates who are trying to uh, extract whatever resources we can. Now, the converse of that, as I always like to tell people, is if that's the type of organization you're in, you know, learn uh, learn some basic piracy and uh, make sure that you're working well until the winds change and you start operating differently. So let's say you get past that bottleneck, right? The next thing that comes up frequently that we certainly in the VMware Tanzu world, and now that I've said VMware Tanzu, I can just say Tanzu, but remember uh, that VMware is the one who makes that, but that we see in Tanzu land is that just raw infrastructure, not only to get started, but also further down, you know, deploying. So I still hear way too many stories of just when a team wants to get started uh, with development, that it takes filing a bunch of tickets just to acquire the infrastructure that they need, just the servers, right, that they need to for their labs to run things, right, to allocate the networking resources, to configure it. Uh, you know, more realistically, there's always a lot of budgeting and uh, proof of concepting going on uh, with, with things to kind of choose as I'll get into the tool suite that they want. But just looking at the pure infrastructure part, what does it take just to get the, as they say, the lab set up for development to start working on things? And typically, this takes a long, long time because it's similar to the budgeting and the strategy, which, you know, going back to that paper I alluded to, uh, let's see, where did it go? The, uh, this, that's, that's the problem with this, this, uh, this paper I was reading is the conclusion is basically like budgeting is the constraint. And I've gone back and reread it, sort of, and they don't really spell out why. But now that I'm walking through it, I'm starting to see that budgeting, always a problem. Justifying that you spend time and money on something uh, is, is often the slowest part of doing something. So, you know, you fill out these tickets because you're going to be spending probably new money to build things out. You're going to be spending time. And so you want to deliberate on that. And it takes a while to get that. And so your team's just waiting around for it. Now, later on, uh, you've got production concerns of how you um, bundle things up and and make them ready for production, which which hopefully, let me let me hopefully I'll get to this later. I might forget here, but 
you know that becomes another bottleneck that the uh, the DevOps world uh, basically started to work on. I'll I'll move this down here to remember to uh, to talk about it. There's development, and then uh, yeah, maybe I should fold that in. But we'll put this here: the infrastructure revisits. Infrastructure revisits. Maybe there's more than four. Anyhow, so. Then let's say you can get your labs. You get past that hurdle of like, we're set up now to do development. We've got the infrastructure layer established. Now the next thing that comes up all the time and thanks to, well, it could be good or bad, but thanks to uh, the way we do, we kind of like the predominant way of thinking about development, cloud native stuff and messaging. That is kind of this, this middle layer of Kubernetes uh, that kind of fits between what used to be infrastructure as a service and paths like there's almost this new layer but then there's also all sorts of new frameworks and architectures you know messaging i don't really know what they all are so i just kind of toss out stuff but there's a lot of new decisions to make about the stack to use right so many times organizations when they're considering um how should we design our software? What's the structure we should follow? What's the programming methodology we should use? What's all the middleware and services we rely on? Um, there's a lot of new stuff to consider. Now, frequently what happens, there's two things going on here. One, people who build stuff like developers and operations people, as I just said, they like to build stuff. So they like to understand new things and they like to build it up and kind of uh, get their hands dirty. They don't necessarily like to just use things off the shelf. We used to call this NIH, not invented here. And um, many companies are uh, infamous for doing that. They'll build their entire stack rather than learn about a new way of doing things and going and using, um, whether it's from a vendor or open source projects or whatever, like they want to kind of build their own thing. And some of that not only is driven by interest in doing that, but there's also, I encounter a lot of people, and this is a question that comes up, who tell me about these special needs that they have. Like they have these requirements uh, that they feel are unique to them. Um, and what I try to gently tell them is that everyone tells me this, and then they kind of go over what the requirements are and they're not really unique like security and governance they always people always go over that and like they all have the security and governance concerns right in every industry most of them have the same basic infrastructure concerns right and instead of focusing on what their technological concerns are right like most all of those are solved and what's not really solved are business concerns right like what are different ways of interacting with their customers how can they make um doing back office things like you know all the workflows required and things more efficient like differentiation really happens at the business side not so much at the uh the infrastructure and the software development framework side at the architecture side uh and so that's a huge bottleneck that people go through is all of that argumentation, right? Like in the same way that you have kind of this uh, argumentation about strategy and finance, all of the architects and the technical people tend up arguing with each other about what they should do. And not only that, they have to then kind of analyze the features, that their requirements and their features, again, that are commonly shared across their industry, if not across all industries. They have to go out and test things and do POCs. Again, the results of which tend to be the same in their industry and across all industries. And anyways, they end up going through that decision process, which is fun, but takes a long time to get through, and then they can start developing. So if you think about it, this is a huge bottleneck, right? And hopefully the, the suggestion is obvious, is that it's probably better just to choose predefined ways of doing things and put those architectures in place, right? Now, obviously, I am extremely biased because there's a tremendous amount from top to bottom in the Tanzu stack, all the way from how you do your infrastructure to the Kubernetes that you run and how that defines a lot of your architecture for your application into the, the service mesh world of how you're integrating and running everything together, all the way to the UI layer and everything in between with your microservices and Spring. And that itself is a cross-industry, well-proven uh, stack for your architecture that you can just choose to use. And there's plenty of fun little wing dings and things to sort out in there, but it'll save you a tremendous amount of time if you choose that architecture. Now, also, uh, a forgotten thing is that once you put that architecture in place, 
you also have to maintain it and build it and evolve it. And that very much so uh, becomes a piece of technical debt. It becomes kind of a strategic bottleneck uh, that it doesn't evolve fast enough and uh, it, it becomes uh, something onerous to, uh, to deal with. Now, before I need to start, I was right in the middle of this section. In development itself, once you've chosen an architecture, there's a, there's another, and a whole other layer of bottlenecks, again, around decisions, uh, which is essentially choosing the tools that you'll use, right? And, you know, you might be choosing programming languages. That itself, I don't think, takes a tremendous amount of time debating as much as these other things. But you often do spend a lot of time talking about the way you're going to be doing your builds, your continuous integrations, the way you'll package things. Um, and the way you might even organize and work with teams, right? Will you do things in more of an agile way? Will you have like a uh, kind of a balanced team like all the people or will you spread the team out, the, the functionality of the teams out? Um, now, I don't think like development, uh, you know, the tools thing can take a while to, to deal with. And developers also can cause a lot of trouble by trying to be efficient on their own and kind of running around all these other people and not really cooperating with them by not shifting left and working with the people ahead of them. Because then... Development's gone off and done their own thing, um, and two things often happen. One, the official forces come in, they bring all their bottlenecks and their troubles, and development just wasted all that effort, and now they've got to become get into that argument cycle with the rest of them and defend what they have or argue against it, so bet you're back to uh, you know analysis paralysis and just silly arguing. Or, uh, I forgot the second thing. Or, you know, what happens with development doing that uh, is they uh, they move on to a new thing and they kind of just leave behind their great way of doing stuff uh, for other people to worry about. And they haven't, because they haven't been involved in the whole enterprise process, they haven't really got hooked into the, the, the long-term maintenance and evolution of this thing. And uh, they can just deliver a project and just kind of desert it and uh, move on. Now, no one intends to be that evil, but... Uh, or not evil, to, to be that uh, malign, but uh, it ends up happening frequently. But I think in general, uh, a lot of the focus on optimization has been focused on software development and QA. And so that part of the cycle actually tends to be pretty optimized, right? Like doing the actual coding, the actual development, the actual testing, especially as I talked last time, when you uh, do things like pairing and rotating pairing, that part's pretty good. Like it's not, it's not, uh, it's not too bad. It's probably the least of your concerns uh, when you're doing bottlenecking. Now, just as I mentioned uh, or alluded to, with kind of rogue developers, mavericks, uh, going off and doing their own things. The next set of bottlenecks you encounter is around governance, and this is this is where the idea of uh, of, of shift, you know, shifting left comes into play as a solution. We'll call this like can't shift left. Uh, hmm. Only shifts, right? Hmm. No shifting. You can call it get shifty. That's that's a that's a reference there for you. Anyways, uh, so what happens here is the development is all done. They're they're done with what they're doing. They might even keep delivering things, right? They're so optimized that they keep delivering builds and features. But it has to go through a security uh, check. It's got to go through a uh, compliance audit. It has to go through checking for enterprise architecture governance, right? There's all this checking and verification that has to happen after the building of the software. And that can slow things down, not only because it has to be done, but if it's violated those things somehow, it has to go back to development for them to work on again. And you can see that this adds a, uh, a pretty sizable bottleneck that's very palpable because you've got the software there it's even been demoed to people so you can see that it works and there's these people that are coming in and saying that it's not that it doesn't work it's that you're not doing something correctly and you're not following the rules um so the way you know a lot of a lot of time stuff thinking in the devops world nowadays uh has gone towards figuring out um these bottlenecks and it's really just about you know as they say shifting left and moving this earlier into the process involving those people and those concerns in development but equally having development understand that security and audit and governance things are key features of their software right in the same way that like you know if you go to a store you don't really consider electri electricity like a key feature you don't really consider like good lighting a feature i mean it's some sophisticated retail people do consider good lighting and how it works as a feature but you know there's all these utility functions that if you didn't have like the roof not falling in like your business couldn't function and developers don't often think of these uh 
what are they, functional requirements? I always forget the name, but those need to be treated seriously. And equally, the security and audit and governance people need to see uh, if those things need to be followed uh, or if they're just kind of made up or, or things that can be automated and uh, not, you know, if they can be baked into the process rather, rather than being checked manually. So finally, uh, like I said, infrastructure revisits thing, right? So then you finally got to deploy the software. And oftentimes what's, what happens, uh, similarly because you uh, haven't shifted left, so to speak, is that there's an entirely new way of packaging and deploying and releasing the software to production. And then you also have to monitor and remediate and troubleshoot problems, right? And you know this adds a huge bottleneck again it adds that thing of like there's a lot of risk involved so we need to spend a lot of time and deliberation uh before we get to this phase and we allow it to happen and similarly this is kind of oddly enough one of the first things that the devops people solved and similarly what you do is you bring this back further into the chain and you make developers care about this and program for infrastructure as one of the features and you have operations people figure out how to treat their infrastructure more as software and part of the application. I mean, I'm giving incredible shorthand to that. But a lot of, again, what uh, what we do in the Tanzu world, particularly the Tanzu application service and things like um, uh, Tanzu Mission Control, where you can manage multiple Kubernetes clusters across clouds or infrastructures or whatever, goes into this idea of how do we standardize the way that we do uh, production concerns. And you have a Tanzu observability, which does this. But a lot of what you're doing here is sharing... Um, that technology between the development world and the, the infrastructure world and really forcing constraints, kind of ways of operating, ways of packaging things, uh, the way that all the components of software work. And um, I think using something like Kubernetes and also the, the, the build packs and the structures that you get in the Tanzu application service, kind of the Cloud Foundry world, uh, it essentially, um, it helps make a lot of these decisions and make sure that you're, you can shift these concerns left and removes that bottleneck for you. So, you know, maybe as I'll put in, it's always good when you're writing a piece to have an unexpected bonus thing at the end, uh, right? And I think another constraint that comes up a lot is, is this thing at the end, right? And I don't think it's so much as a constraint as something that people forget about, right? Like once you actually get the software out the door, now you need to actually observe and make decisions. Uh, you need you need to observe how people are using it and start to study that. And that's something that like we haven't really been able to do in I don't think a very valuable way. Usually that kind of stuff is like way up here and it doesn't really have fast enough feedback or experimentation to kind of make it credible. But you can really start to understand how your business is functioning and what customers want to do a, a lot more closely uh, towards the end here. And you, ha you can't really uh, forget that step. So bottlenecks, look into them, right? Like that's, I think, and I think looking at bottlenecks is a large part of what is uh, management's job to do, right? Like I think, you know, when you think about if we're sh shifting to the servant leadership and pushing decisions down the line to more and more individuals, right? And we don't want executives and managements just to be in these eternal status check things, right? Hopefully, this because you're doing less command and control, this frees up a lot of time for managers to do something else. And I would suggest that what they can start to do uh, is start to look at their organization as a system that they can start to engineer and program. They can look at these value streams and look at the whole thing and start to think about how can we find and remove these bottlenecks? How can we take that servant leadership thing and make the process better for everyone involved in it? Rather than just telling them what to do, let's set up a better system and constantly uh, optimize it for, for running through it. Sounds like some good, some good parenting advice I should go consider. Anyhow, you know, are you interested in uh, figuring all of this out? Well, I've got a suggestion for you. Uh, if I can, let me go to my uh, usual CTA stuff. And, you know, there's a couple of things you can check out. One, I think most relevant to what I was talking about today is let me open this up over here, is what you can do is if you want to talk with us a lot more about these things across all of the bottlenecks, you can schedule an hour, a half day, maybe even a day long uh, workshop with us to kind of start thinking about what is that end to end process. Uh, and if you've seen the uh, interviews I've had with Robbie Clutton, you can see how we start to think about 
what is that end-to-end -end process, that value stream? What are the priorities that you have? How do you start sorting the projects that you would work on uh, to kind of uh, get through those bottlenecks and really get that, that um, flywheel? really get that that uh, process in place where you're innovating your business. So if you go to uh, cote.pizza, you can see it right there. You can go to one of the little, uh, the little tiles here and you can just say, I want some software development office hours. You can just fill that out and uh, hopefully we'll get in contact with you and we can sort that out. Now also, you know, I mentioned that Kubernetes is a good architecture uh, for infrastructure people looking downward, like no judgment on the uh, the direction there, but looking upward uh, towards application developers and enterprise architects. There's a lot, uh, if you couple a service mesh with it, you can define a lot of your architecture. And then like I was saying, if you go further up into uh, the spring and other frameworks that we have in the Tanzu application service, there's also a lot of architecture that you can just start to use without that bottleneck of deciding on testing out and arguing about all these basics uh, that you can start doing. You certainly don't really need to maintain it uh, if you go with a, a third party stack like what we have. So you can check out Kubernetes. There's a lot of great learning uh, things that we have there. If you go to kube.academy, an actual domain name, uh, .academy, and then find, and for developer stuff, uh, kind of as you go up the stack, you can go to tanzu.vmware.com slash developer and uh, check those things out. And then, as you can see, if you want to get the archives for everything, you go to kote.io slash tanzu talk, and uh, you can check out all the archives, see the videos with my funny little slide, uh, thumbnails there and uh, check those out so with that uh, I'll see everyone tomorrow bye bye <laughs>